Praise the Lord. Peace and greetings to you all once again in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is I, Brother Clinton, and you're back on the Word Prophet channel, a Christian ministry dedicated to the purpose of teaching the Word of God to the people in the churches of God so that we can go back to serving God in spirit and in truth, because that's what our Lord Jesus Christ commanded. Alleluia. So this book that I hold in my hand is my Holy Bible, King James Version. For those of us who speak English, this is the Word of God. Other modern English Bibles that are worded differently than this Bible and don't say the same thing as this Bible, well, they're not the Word of God. They're copyrighted novels written and owned by Antichrist men, and they're changed on purpose in order to deceive souls away from the kingdom of God. And so if you speak English, the Word of God is preserved for us in the Holy Bible, King James Version. And if you have yours, and I hope you do, please open up with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to speak with you about something that is very, very important and also something that is very much reviled and looked down upon and scoffed at in the modern churches today. Many times I call them the church businesses because that's exactly what they are. The, that which is called mainstream Christianity today is that which Jesus called the broad path which leadeth unto destruction. And many there, many there are which go in thereat. This is what Jesus said. And it's written in Matthew chapter 17, verses 13 and 14. And the people that are in, in the mainstream, they are part of a, a multi-billion dollar industry that uses the name of Jesus Christ to cause religious entertainers to become rich and wealthy and powerful in this world because their kingdom is of this world. And so they use the Bible in various ways in order to deceive people away from the kingdom of God and into their organizations that they call churches. If any of you have ever actually taken the time to read the whole Bible, you probably have noticed that there's no such thing in the Bible anywhere as the act that is known today as going to church. Going to church isn't something that Christians do. It's religious entertainment for sinners. It's given to you by Rome, just like professional football, hockey, basketball, baseball, tennis, uh, circuses, uh, rock concerts. All that stuff is given to you by Rome as the, the shiny, attractive things that lead you away from exactly where you need to be, and that is abiding in the Word of God. Because remember that Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so the reason, the reason, the main reason that most people that profess to be Christians are so lost and confused and deceived is because they're going to church instead of reading the Bible. And I know that many who go to church, they will say, well, my pastor preaches straight out of the Bible. Well, with all due respect, yes, of course your pastor preaches straight out of the Bible. The pastor at the Baptist church preaches straight out of the Bible when he's lying to the people in the Baptist church. And the pastor in the Pentecostal church preaches straight out of the Bible when he's lying to the people in the Pentecostal church. The pastor in the Catholic church preaches straight out of the Bible when he's lying to the people in the Catholic Church. And so this, so it is in the Lutheran Church, and in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and in the Mormon Church, and the Jehovah's Witness Church, and I could go on and on and on. And all those men preach straight out of the Bible. The thing is that they take a verse or two out of the Scripture, and then they close their Bibles, and everybody in the congregation closes their Bibles, and then they make up a story that isn't true. And none of the people in the congregation know that they're being lied to because they haven't read their Bibles. The only parts of the Bible that they know are the parts that they hear quoted from the pulpit. And that's the reason why they're so lost and confused, because they have this really unwise notion in their hearts when they go to church that they don't have to read their Bibles because their pastor knows the Bible. See, their pastor knows the Bible, and they're trusting in him to teach them what the Bible says, instead of actually just reading the Bible for themselves. And that's why I, as a Christian minister, ordained of Jesus Christ and not of men, am always telling people, stop going to church and start reading your Bible. If you haven't read through the whole Bible, if you say that you've been a Christian for more than six months and you haven't read through the whole Bible even one time yet, you're in trouble. You're in trouble because you don't know the Word of God. You don't have the Word of God abiding in you. And for that reason, you can go to this church or that church or whatever church you choose, whatever church preaches the, the kind of flavor of religion you like, and you can pay for that entertainment. 
but you will never know who is lying to you and who is telling you the truth. You're not going to know whether I'm telling you the truth unless you know the truth for yourself. And this is the, the crux of what I've been preaching online, on the internet, for more than 15 years. I've preached a lot of things from the Bible, and will continue to preach a lot of things from the Bible, including the subject matter that I'm going to get into today in a, in a minute or so here. But the most important thing is that you read the Bible for yourself. And of course, obey God. Because if you don't obey when you read the Bible, if you don't obey what the Bible says, then you won't be able to understand what the Bible says. Because the Bible says, a good understanding have all they that do his commandments. And again, be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1.22 So if you read the Bible, but you don't do what the Bible says, then you won't understand the Bible. Because understanding of the Bible doesn't come from human intellect. It comes by revelation from God, who is the author of the words that are in this book. Praise the Lord. So if you will read the Bible, there's an ant there. <laughs> Pardon me. If you will read the Bible and do what is written in the Bible, do what God commands you to do, then he will give you understanding. Praise the Lord. And if you don't, then he won't. And you'll wind up in one of those denominations and, and proclaiming all of your life, well, my pastor preaches straight out, of, straight out of the Bible, and you'll wind up in hellfire, which is where more than 99% of people that profess to be Christians are headed right now, right this very moment. And so that which I'm about to speak to you about is something that most people in the modern church businesses will reject, will scorn, will revile, and they will make up excuse after excuse, and they will hire their theologians to explain it away for them so that they don't have to believe it. But it's a very, very basic and foundational truth of the Holy Scripture. And what I'm talking to you about is subjection and submission. Subjection and submission. Those of us who are Christians, and this is the reason that I had you open up to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 22 in just a moment. Uh, actually, we should start in verse 21. However, let me just say another couple of things. Those of us who are Christians, we have a Lord. What is a Lord? The word Lord is thrown around very much in the denominational churches. But do people really understand what a Lord is and what a Lord with a capital L is? Praise the Lord. We see the word Lord three different ways in the Bible. We see it in all capital letters. We see it with a capital L and then a lowercase o-r-d. And then we see it in all lowercase letters. And in each of those three cases, those words mean something completely different. When we see the word Lord in all capital letters, it is a transliteration of the name Jehovah. And the name Jehovah was not taken out of the Bible. It is represented to us by the word Lord in all capital letters on purpose. And it is preserved as Jehovah in all capital letters exactly seven times in the Old Testament. And that is for good reason. And if you'd like to learn about that, just ask me and I'll be happy to send you a message in a video that I preached about this. Some, it's called something like why the name Jehovah is translated as Lord. I don't remember the exact title of the video, but if you write to me and ask me for it, I'll be happy to, to send you a link to it and and explain to you by means of that video why it is that the word, or that, 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 pardon me, why it is that the name Jehovah is translated as Lord in all capital letters all times except for seven in the Old Testament. And it is for a very good reason. It's on purpose, the purpose of God. Praise the Lord. So, then we have the word Lord with a capital L and a lowercase o-r-d. And that is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. And when we read that word Lord with a capital L in the Old Testament, it signifies the word Adonai, the Hebrew word Adonai, which means master, Lord. That's what a Lord is. A Lord is a master. Someone who is your Lord is your master. So for those of us who are Christians, our Lord is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is that man that God hath ordained to judge the quick and the dead. He is the one that is going to sit upon the throne of David his father, because he is the seed of David, according to the flesh. And he is the one that is going to sit and reign over all the world. He is our Lord, our Master. And the third instance of the word Lord is in all lowercase letters, L-O-R-D. We see that several times in the scripture, and this is referring to someone's Master, who isn't Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords. When, when we speak of him, the Lord, 
then we spell it with a capital L because it's a proper noun and it's speaking of one particular person, the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we see the word Lord with a small l, then it's referring to a Lord, not the Lord, a Lord. Now, a Lord is a man who is a person who has servants, a person who is a householder, a person who is a husband. A husband is a Lord. A husband is his wife's Lord. He is her master. Just as Jesus Christ is our Lord, if we're Christians, he is our master. What does that mean? It means that whatever he commands, that's what we do. And we do it willingly. We do it with a willing and a joyful heart because he is our Lord. Okay. I made a video, of, I don't know, maybe about a year or so ago called, Why Do People Want a Personal Lord and Savior? And the crux of the message in that video is that the reason that the people in the, in the denominational false churches want a personal Lord and Savior is because they don't want Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be their Lord. They want to invent a different Lord and call it Jesus Christ. They want it to be personal just for them so that they can be whatever they want to be and then have this person, that this imaginary person that they call Jesus, who accepts them as they are. You see, that's why they want a personal Lord and Savior, because the Bible doesn't say anything about having a personal Lord and Savior. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. See, that's a tradition of the false churches, the denominational mainstream churches, the broad path that leadeth unto destruction. They want a personal Lord and Savior because they want to make up an imaginary Jesus which conforms to their desires. Instead of them changing their lives to conform to the desires of our Lord Jesus Christ and serving him as their master and their Lord, they don't want that. They want a personal Lord and Savior, one that is imaginary and doesn't exist, and one that is tailor-made for their own personal desires. You see, it's a form of psychopathy. It's, it's, it's them imagining an imaginary Jesus that doesn't exist, which accepts them as they are, so that they don't have to actually obey the Word of God. They don't have to actually take the Word of God literally. They just carry their Bibles under their arms when they go to church, and they think that they're pleasing God, and they just do whatever they want to do. And they have this imaginary Lord that they call their personal Lord and Savior that agrees with them in everything that they want to do. You see? But that's not the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's the imaginations of men. People aren't used to living in a kingdom. All of us who are watching this video are probably raised, pardon me, in the part of the world that is called the West, with very few exceptions. Um, most of us who are watching this video are, were raised up in the part of the world that is called the West. And in the West, a king or a kingdom is a very foreign notion to most of us. We have all grown up in societies where we have been exposed to the facade of democracy. And so we have been raised up in a world where it's considered acceptable to just do whatever you want and you probably won't get caught. And even if you do get caught, you'll probably get a slap on the wrist and get released the next day from jail or whatever if you commit a crime. Or, or you know, we live in a society where people can just, you know, make little, they have these things on the, th pardon me, they have these things on the internet that they call memes which is, I guess, a name for, um, you know, a little cartoon picture with a saying in it or something like that. And people can make memes and post them online, reviling their own leaders, reviling those that are in authority, and, they, and nothing happens to them. Well, you can't do that in a kingdom, you see. But there are kingdoms in the world today. There are kings and queens ruling in the world today, but they're doing it in the background, behind the curtain of the facade of democracy. So they don't... Um, they don't come to your house and take you away when you make a meme online making a joke about one of your leaders. But it's written in the scripture, Thou shalt not revile the gods. Thou shalt not speak evil of the rulers of thy people. When it's written in the, in the Old Testament, Thou shalt not revile the gods. The word gods there is a transliteration of the word Elohim, a translation rather of the word Elohim, and it means the leaders, those who are kings and princes over you, those who are put in authority over you. See, and that's why Paul, the apostle, when he, when he referred to that verse of the scripture, he said, Thou shalt not speak evil of the rulers of thy people. Um, and this is the word of God, and Christians don't do that. But the, the people in the world, they, they, that's how we were all raised up. 
You see, that's how we were all raised up, that we can just pretty much do whatever we want and we can speak evil of the, of the president or of the a mayor or a governor or a judge or whatever, and we can just mock and make fun of them and stuff like that. Well, in a kingdom, that doesn't go. You don't do that in a kingdom. In a kingdom, you have a king. He's sitting on the throne and he has the power to take your life from the earth if he so desires. And he doesn't have to go through Congress to get anybody's permission to do it. You see, when a king is sitting on the throne and you do something that upsets him, then your life is in danger. And if he calls for you and his guards come and get you and he says, cut his head off, then they'll cut your head off. Period. You, you don't get a trial. You don't, you don't get a lawyer. Okay? It's just you and the king. And so if you're pleasing to the king, then he'll be pleased with you and you'll be blessed and happy in his kingdom. And if you're not, then he'll kill you. He'll take your life from the earth. You see, that's what living in a kingdom is all about. Living in a kingdom means loving and serving and honoring your king. And when you come into the presence of your king, you don't just saunter into his presence and go, Hey, king. Hey, JJ. What's up? No. You, you, when you enter into his presence, if you are called into his presence, you bow before him with your face to the ground and you worship him. You say something like, O king, live forever. You see, blessed be the name of the Lord. When you bow before the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't just saunter into his presence and say, Hey, Jesus, my little God in a bottle, my personal Lord and Savior, this is what I'd like for you to do for me today. Nay, Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> Pardon me. Give us this day our daily bread. Hallelujah. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This is how we enter into the presence of a king, especially the king of kings. And that's what this video message is about. I've been speaking for almost 18 minutes now, and I'm just getting to the meat of the message. But it's very important that I've spoken these things first in order to kind of set the stage for what I'm about to speak to you about. Because most people in the church businesses today, most people that have gone to church and profess to be Christians, and I don't mean to revile anybody, I'm speaking these things in love because I've been there too. I've been there too. If you've been going to church all your life and you believe whatever is taught at your church, I've been there too. Okay? I'm not better than you. I'm not better than anybody. But I'm a minister of Jesus Christ, and these are the things that He has put into my heart and into my mouth by His Spirit to speak unto you in His name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So most people today have no idea what it is to live in a kingdom. Most people these days have no concept of submission and subjection. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. When we come before our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't walk into his presence and address him by a nickname and then start naming off all the things that we want him to do today. No. He's our Lord. He's our Lord. He's our Master. We bow before him because he is worthy of our worship. We bow before him. We honor him. We glorify him. And then if we have petitions, we make those petitions of him graciously, humbly, and meekly. And if we are walking according to his word and we have his word abiding in us and we're abiding in his word, then we can ask whatever we will and it shall be done unto us. Why? Because our king is pleased with us. He loves us. That's why he redeemed us with his own blood. Praise the Lord. And in the same way, a married man is his wife's Lord. He is not her partner. They're not, you know, they're they're not partners in marriage. A man's wife is his servant. That's what a wife is. Okay? A wife is a servant. When God made man, the first man, God made man in his image. And one of the first things he said after he made the man was, "It is not good that the man should be alone." And then he said, "I will make him and help meet for him and help meet for him not an helpmate the word helpmate isn't really an english word at least I'm, i don't think it is 
and it's it's for sure not found in the Bible anywhere. There's no word in the Bible as there's no such word in the Bible as helpmate. And help meet for him. It's two words, help meet. And help is a servant. And the word meet, M E E T, means suitable. Suitable, appropriate. That's what meet means, M E E T, meet. It means appropriate or suitable. So God said, I will make him and help meet for him. And so he took a rib out of his side and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And out of the rib, he made a woman and he brought the woman unto the man. And the man saw the woman that she was beautiful. She was naked. She was humble. She was meek. And she was there to serve him. That's what he created her for. That's what God created her for. And so Adam took her to wife. He said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. See, so he took her to be part of his body. And then he gave her his name. And then, of course, he knew her and she brought forth children. She bare him children. So God created Eve to be in help meet for Adam because it was not good that the man should be alone. A man's wife is his servant. She is not her ma- pardon me, she is not his master. She is not his ruler. She is not there to manipulate him, to try to get whatever she wants out of him. She is not there to be another mother for him, to tell him what to do, to order him around, to treat him like a little puppy dog. She is there to submit herself before him in the same way, in the exact same way that those of us who are Christians submit ourselves before our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you about in this message. So let's begin in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. It's in the middle of a sentence, actually, but it says, Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. Hallelujah. Submission is something very important for us to understand in the kingdom of God, in the church of Jesus Christ. Those of us who don't understand submission will not enter into the kingdom because if you don't understand how to submit yourself to the king, then he's not going to have you in his kingdom. It's really just that simple. It's a salvation issue. Yes, it is. Praise the Lord. Everything that is written in this book is a salvation issue because this book, the words that are written in this book is that flaming sword that turns every way that God put at the east of the Garden of Eden to keep the way of the tree of life. See, the only way back into the garden, the only way to have access to the tree of life from which Adam and his wife were expelled is this word, the words that are in this book. This word is the sword of the Spirit. It is that flaming sword that turned every way. And the only way for anyone to have access back into the garden and the tree of life is through this word. And that's why it's written in the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation twenty-two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and that they may enter in through the gates into the city. So we must learn about submission. Now Peter said in his epistle that we are to submit ourselves to those that are in authority over us in the body of Christ. And at the same time, we are also all to submit one to another, which is to say that if there's someone who is over us in the Lord, then we need to submit ourselves to him and to his ministry. However, he himself is not a lord or a master over anybody except his own wife. And he also is capable of making mistakes. We have the example of Peter in the the letter to the Galatians. Paul wrote to the Galatians and said that Peter had erred in a certain matter. Now, the Catholics think that Peter was the first pope, which is quite a ridiculous notion, actually, because Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ. And popes are antichrist. But if it is true that Peter was a pope, then that means that he can't be wrong, ever. But that's not the case. See, Peter was an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the second highest office in the entire kingdom, except for the king. But Peter made a mistake, and Paul reproved him for that mistake. And what did Peter do? He didn't exalt himself and say, Hey, listen, Paul, I was an apostle before you. I can't be wrong. Nay, he repented. Of course he repented. We don't read in the scripture that he repented, but of course he did. When he found out that he was wrong, he stopped doing what was wrong. See, so we all need to be submitted one to another. 
And there's times when a husband could be wrong about something. And if he is, then there's ways for his wife to reprove him and correct him, offer him correction about that. But she doesn't stand up over him and offer him correction as if she is his superior. But she offers it meekly from beneath, usually in the form of a question. And a godly man will receive that. See, now not everybody is a godly man or a godly woman. I understand that when I'm making this video message. What I'm speaking about and those who I'm speaking to in this video message are Christians. So if you're a woman and you have an ungodly husband, um, I'm not going to be addressing that in this video. Or if, you ha if you're a man and you have an ungodly wife, I'm not going to be addressing that specifically in this video. This video message is instruction for those who are in Christ Jesus. Although this will help you if you have an unbelieving spouse, it's not specifically addressed to that. So, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then verse 22 says, Ephesians 5, 22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. It's really just that simple. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. So, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian woman, and you submit yourself unto the Lord, because He is your Lord, if you don't submit yourself to Him, then He's, he's not really your Lord. He will still destroy you, because he, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But He's not really your Lord if you're not obeying Him. But if you're obeying Him, if you're submitted to Him, if you bow before Him, if you humble yourself before Him, if His will is your desire, if your desire is to do His will, if your happiness comes from knowing that you have pleased Jesus Christ, then then he is your Lord. And if you are a wife, then you are to submit yourself to your husband as unto the Lord, which means in the exact same way. In the exact same way. The exact same way that you come before the Lord Jesus Christ is the exact same way that you should come before your husband because he is your Lord. Your husband is your Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Okay, here we have the word as again. As, even as, in the exact same way. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. In the same way that Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. In the same way. And those of us who are born again, we have the Word of God abiding in us because the Word of God is what we're born from if we're born again. Then we know that a woman's husband is her Lord. He is her master. He is to love her and cherish her and treat her well as our Lord Jesus Christ does with His church. And she is to honor and obey Him and reverence Him. Yes, I said reverence Him. Why did I say that? Because that's what the Bible says. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. In everything. If you are a wife, you do not reserve the right to tell your husband no. Unless, unless... He is commanding you to do something that would be a sin against God. If he's commanding you to do something that would be a sin against God, like worship an idol, or conspire with him to steal from somebody, or something like that, then of course you would have to say, No, sir, I cannot be a partaker with you in that. And by the way, that's how you address your husband, with the words, Sir, or Lord, or Master. Yes, Master. Yes, Lord. Yes, Sir. That's the way you address your husband. You don't address your husband by his name. You address him by the title Sir or Master or Lord because that's what he is. Okay, It's not that it's wrong or against the law for you to call your husband by his name. But in most cases, it's just outright disrespectful to call him by his name. His mother calls him by his name. His friends call him by his name. You are his servant. You call him Sir. That is the proper way for a woman to address her husband. In fact, that's the proper way for a woman to address any man. Sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. I love you, sir. Are you well, sir? 
Can I do something for you, sir? Are you comfortable, sir? Is there something bothering you, sir? That's how a wife speaks to her husband. See, we don't come before the throne of God and say, Hey, Jesus, what's up? As if we were just, you know, two friends meeting on the beach. You know, he's not our buddy that's meeting us on the beach. He's the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He sits upon the throne of glory and our lives are in his hand. And he has the power to take our lives and he has the power to give us life. He is the life. And so we know his name and we pray in his name and we're baptized in his name and we glorify his name, but we don't just waltz into his presence and call him by his name. We call him Lord and Master and Sir because those are titles that pertain to what he is. And we are his servants. We are not his equals. And yes, he has said, I call you friends if you do the things that I command you. See, if you don't do the things that he commands you, then you're not his friend. But even though those of us who obey him, we are his friends, we don't just we don't treat him like the guy down the street or our neighbor next door, because he's not either one of those things. He's our Lord, and he is worthy of reverence and honor and subjection and submission. And he will have it. And if he doesn't get it from you, then you'll go to hell and he'll get it from somebody else. But his kingdom is going to be filled with those who love him and worship him and honor him and reverence him. Not people that think that he's their sky daddy and that he's their best buddy and that they can just live however they want to live and they can imagine him to be their personal Lord and Savior. Those people are going to inherit the blackness of darkness forever. Period. So as we get back into the scripture, let's start again in verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. And as I said to you a few minutes ago, the only exception to that would be if your husband commands you to do something that is against God's law. And by the way, just let me make a parenthetical statement here. When you are alone with your husband in your marriage chamber, in your marriage bed, there is nothing that you are forbidden by God to do with him. Your husband may do whatever he wants with your body, as also you have the right to do whatever you please with your husband's body. You're supposed to be sharing your bodies with one another. There is nothing that is forbidden you in the marriage bed, as long as you're not, you know, killing each other or breaking each other's limbs or, you know, obviously something that would be a sin against God, harming each other in some way. But if, if you're in your marriage bed and you're making love one to another, then there is nothing that is forbidden you in your marriage bed. That's what the marriage bed is for, for you to explore your lover's flesh. You see, your husband or your wife, that's what it's for. So there's nothing that is forbidden you in the marriage bed. So if your husband wants you to do something with him in the marriage bed, there is nothing to which you should re respond with the answer, no. You do not have the right to refuse any part of your body to your husband. Nor does he have the right to refuse any part of his body to you. Because his body belongs to you and yours to him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And if you'd like to learn more about that, please ask and I'll refer you to a video on this channel, which is called Hebrews 13.4. Uh, what is forbidden in the marriage bed, or something like that. Praise the Lord. But I digress. That was a parenthetical statement. Just in case there's any of you wives out there who think that you have the right to refuse your husband some sexual act in the marriage bed. And please understand that there's going to be, in the comment section here, you're not going to be asking me about specific sexual acts. If you do that, I'm going to delete your comment. That's not proper for us to be speaking about. And it's not necessary for us to be speaking about. Okay? There is nothing. There is nothing that is forbidden between a man and his wife in their marriage bed. Praise the Lord. Um, so, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. The Lord loves his church. His church is his bride. We are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And we're going to read that in a moment here. And so how does the Lord treat us? Does he treat us like dogs? Does he beat us? Does he shout profanities at us? When we come to him and ask him for his attention, does he say, no, get away from me with that. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Or if we come to him with something that's important to us, does he say, you, you wasted my time with that? That's just stupid. No, he never says anything like that to us. If it's important to us, it's important to him. And if we abide in his word and his word abides in us, then we're going to be asking him the things that are according to his will. And if we do that, then he knows, pardon me, then we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And so when a man's wife comes to him and she makes a petition of him, he doesn't tell her, that's, you wasted my time with that. I can't believe you brought that to me. That's just stupid. Go take, that, go, go take care of that yourself. I don't have time for that. No, no husband would do that. Well, I shouldn't say that because there are a lot of husbands who do, but no, no husband would rightly do that. That doesn't pertain to a husband to say anything like that to his wife ever. A husband doesn't re, uh, rail on his wife. A husband doesn't speak profanity to his wife. A husband doesn't call her names like, you know, you're so stupid, you're worthless, you're this, you're that. No, no husband should ever speak such things to his wife. And no parent also should ever speak such things unto their children. Nobody should speak like thing, things like that to anybody. And if you're, especially if you're a Christian, reviling isn't part of your vocabulary. If you're a Christian, reviling is not a part of your vocabulary. See, you don't call people stupid and idiots and morons and, and you know, ask them if, they, if their mother had any children that lived and all that stuff and make jokes about them and, and demean them and, and belittle them. Those are the things that sinners do. Christians don't do that. So if you're a godly man and you have a wife, then you treat her as the Lord treats his church. Because if you don't, then how, to whatever degree you mistreat your wife, you can expect that same treatment from your master which is in heaven. Praise the Lord. That's the fact. So, let's continue. Verse 30. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. How are we members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones? Because we have been brought into a marriage. We have been betrothed unto one head, even Christ. Those of us, whether we are male or female, when we are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with his Spirit, we are born of water and of the Spirit. We have a covenant with the living God by His Son, Jesus Christ. We are in God our Father because we are in Jesus Christ, His Son. And His Son is in His Father. You see? And His Father is in Him. So if we're in Jesus Christ, then we are also in the Father, and the Father is in us. The Father is also called the Holy Ghost. You see? The same Holy Ghost that was in Jesus Christ that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, is also now in us who have believed his gospel. We're baptized in his name. We're filled with his spirit. And so we are his bride. We are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. We haven't been married yet. He hasn't married us yet. We are betrothed to him. And if on the day of the wedding we are found to have been faithful to him, then he will marry us. He will know us. He will take us into the lifelong covenant of marriage and we will be transformed into the same kind of body like His glorious body. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm thinking of a, of a verse of the Scripture in Philippians chapter 3 right now. It says in verse 21, Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. He is able to subdue all things unto himself. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you understand that? Do you understand that? He is not some, some meek little homosexual man like the paintings of the Roman Catholics depict their Jesus to be. He is not some weak, skinny little pushover like the Roman Catholic and Protestant churches want you to think. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. 
He is Lord of all. All power is given unto Him in heaven and in earth. And you're either baptized in His name and filled with His Spirit and walking in His commandments, or you're not. And if you're not, then you're hell-bound. And He will take delight in casting you into the fire of hell. And you can scream all you want and He won't care. Because He has come in the flesh to lay down His life for you so that you could have life through His name. No king in the history of the, of the world or of the universe has ever done what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. Only Him. No king in the history of the universe could ever do what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for His people. Yea, for the whole world, anyone who will believe and come unto Him. No king has done or could do or would do what our Lord Jesus Christ did. And He is worthy of your worship and your obedience and your submission. And if you are a wife, then your husband is also worthy of that same reverence and obedience and submission because he is your head. He is the savior of the body. He is the head of your house. He is the one who makes the decisions. He tells you what you shall wear. He tells you where you shall go. He tells you who you're allowed to speak to and who you're not allowed to speak to. He tells you if you're allowed to have a phone or if you're not allowed to have a phone. Or if you do have a phone, what things you're allowed to access on your phone. He tells you those things. He tells you what time dinner should be ready and what he would like to have to eat. He tells you what, she, what you should wear, both when you're out in public and when you're at home with him. See, that's, those are his decisions. If he's a Christian man, those are his decisions. If he's not a Christian man and you're a wife, that would make it a little difficult. But still, he is your Lord. He is your master. He is your head. And you are to be subject to him even as the church is unto Christ. And if you're a husband, then you are to love your wife and cherish her and teach her and take authority over her and do not let her run wild. Do not let her run free. It's just like a little child. Now, I know that your wife isn't a little child. Well, if she acts like a little child, then I guess she deserves to be treated like a little child. But your wife is a grown woman. She's not a little child. But at the same time, just as children need boundaries, so does a wife need boundaries. And so do you. And, you. and Jesus Christ gives you your boundaries because he is your head. And you give your wife boundaries because you are her head. And that's not demeaning to her. And it's not slavery for her. And it's not oppression towards her. Just like it's not demeaning or slavery or oppression for us to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. When he gave his commandments, which are written in this word, his commandments are for our good and for his honor and glory. So we who love him keep his commandments. When we look to him, he doesn't tell us, I don't know, do whatever you want. He doesn't tell us that. He's our head. We look to him for guidance and leadership and boundaries and direction. And so it is that your wife needs boundaries and direction and guidance whether she understands that or realizes it or not she needs those things because she is a woman and if she's been rebellious and taught to be rebellious all of her life then it's time for you to teach her to stop being rebellious it's time for you to teach her that she is your wife she's living in your house and she's going to obey your rules and your rules are going to reflect god's rules god's law See, when I was a kid, my dad used to have a saying, my house, my rules. My dad was not a godly man, but you know what? Regarding that saying, he was right. My house, my rules. If you want to live in my house, then you're going to keep my rules. And if you don't want to keep my rules, but you want to make up your own rules, then there's only one thing that you need. You need your own house. You see, you go out and get your own house, and then you can make your own rules. But in my house, you're going to keep my rules, you see. And that's not oppression, and it's not slavery. It's righteousness, and it's goodness, and it's truth, and it's order, and it's peace. And so, if you are a man, and you have a, a wife, you're a married man, you have a wife, you need to teach her, now this is of course a message for Christians, you need to teach her, how to be in subjection. Now, how does the Lord teach us how to be in subjection? Did he come from heaven with a big old black whip and crack it across our back and, and leave scars on our back to teach us to, to fear him because of, you know, of, of pain? 
No, no, he didn't do that. He didn't come telling us that if you don't serve me, then I'm going to give you pain. He came suffering the pain that we deserved for us, and then he rose from the dead and showed us that he is worthy of our worship and service. And so we who love him serve him. We who are wise, by the grace of God, serve him. As it has been said, wise men still follow Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so if you are a husband and you're teaching your wife to be in subjection unto you, then you need to be in subjection to our Lord Jesus Christ first. Because how are you going to expect her to be in subjection to you if you're not in subjection to Jesus Christ? How do you expect her to submit herself to your headship if you're not submitted to the headship of your head, which is Jesus Christ? See, Jesus Christ is submitted to his head, which is God. And so for that reason, we rightly ought to be subject to his headship. God is the head of Christ. And Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of the woman. So let's not get the cart before the horse. If you're a man, you have no right to, to expect your wife to be in subjection to you until you are in subjection to Jesus Christ. And when she sees that you are in subjection to Jesus Christ, then you will be able to teach her about her being subject unto you. And you teach her in love and with meekness, but at the same time with authority and firmly. Okay, Your wife isn't the master of the house. Your wife doesn't decide what she's going to do, where she's going to go, what she's going to wear, who she's going to talk to, who she's going to hang out with, who she's going to communicate with on her phone if she has a phone. Your wife, th th those, none of those decisions pertain to her. You are the husband. You decide whether or not she's going to have a phone or whether or not she's going to communicate with certain people or whether or not she's going to go to a certain place or wear a certain thing. Those are all your decisions. And perhaps in time past, she has gotten out of control because you have allowed her to make all those decisions for herself. Just like if you have children and you just say to them when they're six years old, do whatever you want. Hey, Dad, can I go over to my friend's house and stay there for a week? Sure, Johnny, go ahead, do whatever you want. You know, and so the, he goes over to Johnny's house and they're over there drinking beers and smoking pot and fornicating with girls and, you know, and then all of a sudden he comes home and he's, you know, he's 10 years old and he has a girlfriend and she's pregnant and, you know, all that, you know that story. That's what kids do when you leave them to themselves. You see, that's why the Bible says a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. And in the same way, a wife that is not under control will bring shame unto her husband. She is as rottenness in his bones, as the scripture says. See, a wife that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in her husband's bones. It's like a cancer in your bones that eats you from the inside out. So a man's wife is to be in subject, pardon me, in subjection unto him. That's the right and the good way. It's been that way ever since Adam was created in the garden, and God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So he created a beautiful, naked woman that was humble and shy and meek and submissive, and he brought her unto him and he married her. He married her. Praise the Lord. And they had many happy years together because he lived to be 930 years old. We don't know from the Bible how old Eve was when she died, but we know that they had many happy, wonderful years together. They had many, many sons and daughters together. Okay? So a man's wife is an help meet for him, a suitable servant for him. Okay, a, a man's wife doesn't manipulate him. That's, at least that she, that's not what she's supposed to do. She's, she's not there to manipulate him. She's not there to get her way. She's not there to get money out of him. She's there to serve him, to serve him, to dedicate her life to serving him. She is happy when she knows that her Lord is pleased with her service. You see, that's what a wife's happiness is. And a man who is a husband loves his wife and he cherishes her even as his own flesh because she is bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he teaches her and he gives her boundaries. He washes her with the word of God. He teaches her what the word of God says in love and humbly, but also with authority because he has 
that authority, and he must exercise that authority. Otherwise, his wife will be out of control. Just like if parents don't exercise authority over their children, their children will be out of control. And just like we as men, if there was no authority exercised over us by our Lord Jesus Christ, we also would be out of control. You see, there's only one sovereign, and that's God. You see, other than God, everybody else has headship. Our Lord Jesus Christ has headship. His head is God. Those of us who are men of God, we have headship. Our head is Jesus Christ. We do as He commands us. We fear Him, we revere Him, we love Him, and we honor Him. We are submitted unto Him. We come before Him on our knees, and we call Him Lord and Master and Sir, because these are titles that are worthy of who He is. You see? And a woman has headship. If she's married, her head is her husband. If she's not married, then her head is her father. And she refers to her husband or her father as sir. That's how a woman should address her husband or her father or any man. And the woman is subject unto the husband. And the husband has the, has the, the responsibility before God to keep his wife in line, to teach her how to serve him. If she doesn't know, and most Western women don't know, because most Western women were raised completely wrong and taught everything completely wrong about relationships and marriage and life and everything. You see, as all of us were. But I'm not picking on women, just women, because the reason, a lot of the reason anyway, that women are out of control in Western society is because men are out of control in Western society. If men would learn to act like men, then women would learn to act like women. It's really just that simple. So if you're a husband, then this message is primarily for you so that you can understand the headship that you are under as a Christian and the headship that you exercise and should be exercising as a husband so that your wife can learn to be in subjection under you. Remember that, as I've said many times, that nobody, nobody can know anything except they first learn it. It doesn't matter how basic or simple it might seem to you or me. Unless somebody learns something, they can't know it. Okay? We know how to tie our shoes. But there was a time when we didn't know how to tie our shoes. We had to learn it. You see? And once we learned it, then we knew how. And women today don't know how to be wives. Women that were raised in Western society and they, they have this tradition where they, 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 they flaunt their bodies and they sexualize themselves and so they, they find men and they fornicate with a lot of men until they find the one that they like the most and then this man kneels before her in subjection unto her like slobbering in front of her like a little puppy dog or something and offers her an expensive ring and she says, okay, I will. And then, you know, they get they go to a judge or justice of the peace and they get this contract with the state and then she manipulates him out of everything that he has and then she eventually divorces him and then forces him to pay her to raise their children. Um, that's what Western women are taught. And that's completely a satanic doctrine. It's completely a satanic doctrine. Everything about it is satanic. Nothing about that story that I just told you has anything to do with a real, actual marriage according as God has ordained it to be. I'm not saying that they're, when they got married, they weren't actually married. But what I'm saying is they knew nothing about what a marriage is supposed to be. And that's why their marriage is always destroyed. You see? But a marriage between a man and a woman is the same as the relationship between a man and his Lord Jesus Christ, or a woman and her Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the church is to Jesus Christ our Lord, so is a wife to her husband. And so, in the, in, I'm going to make a parallel for you. In the churches today, in the modern church businesses today, the people have their personal Lord and Savior. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of Kings. They have a personal Lord and Savior a different God, a deity that they've made up in their minds, and they call it Jesus Christ. And so, because they've invented this Jesus Christ that doesn't exist, now they're free to invent whatever kind of Christianity they want. And so they can do whatever they want, they can go wherever they want, they can dress however they want, they can, they can waste their time all day and do all the things that they want to do and profess to be the bride of Christ. But they're lying, they're not the bride of Christ. And so it is that in Western society today, women are taught 
that they can do whatever they want, say whatever they want, act however they want, dress however they want, and then make their husband accept them and pay them because they got a contract with the state, so he has to pay her. You see, whether or not he lives with her, whether or not she lives with him, even if she leaves and divorces him and goes to live with some other man, he still has to pay her, even though she's not in his house serving him as his wife. See, that's thievery. And thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Did you know that? Thieves shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither shall adulterers or adulteresses. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another man, she's living in open adultery. And so is that man. He's living in open adultery with another man's wife. But I digress. In the same way that the churches, the church businesses today, which reject the word of God and still profess to be Christians, in the same way that they dishonor their husbands, so par, pardon me, their husband, Jesus Christ, so it is that Western women are taught to dishonor their husbands and still imagine that they are, um, that they are, that that's how marriage is supposed to be. You see, and so they're happy and their husbands are miserable. And they just live the rest of their lives that way. Well, that's not what a marriage is supposed to be. And if we will do what God said, then a marriage is a beautiful and awesome thing. And I know, because I'm blessed with one. I'm blessed with a good godly wife. She's respectful and honest and hardworking and faithful and true and beautiful. And and I love her. I love her more than any other human on this on this planet. And... She's my best friend, and she's my servant. And when she speaks to me, she calls me sir. She doesn't call me by my name. She she does sometimes when we're you know when we're intimate or whatever. But um, you know when we're in public, she doesn't call me by my name. She doesn't say, "Hey, Clinton, this man wants to speak to you." Or whatever. No, no. And and she has every once in a while, and I'll correct her on that, and she understands. I and I, I let her know that's not how you address me in public. And then she humbly agrees, and she understands, and she apologizes. But when we're in public. She says, sir, sir, which, you know, we speak Spanish when I'm speaking with her because she doesn't speak English. So it's señor. You know, to her, I am señor. That's my name to her. Okay? You might call me Clinton because we're brothers. See? Or you're my sister or whatever. But when my wife addresses me, she calls me sir because that's what I am. Okay? Is that demeaning for her? No, of course not. That's what she is to me, just as I am to my Lord. And when I speak with my Lord, I call him Sir, Lord, Master. Is that demeaning to me? No, of course not. It's a joy for me to be able to call him my Lord. Because I used to be in the darkness, and now I'm in the light. You see? Well, my wife can say the same thing. She was in the darkness, and now she's in the light, because I've shown her the light of the Word of God. And I provide for her, and I give her the things that she has need of. And all she has to do is work to please me. That's what she's here for. That's what God put her in my life to do, to please me. And when she, serves, when she works to please me, then when she sees that I am pleased, then she's happy. And she doesn't have to worry about the things that she has need of, because as God provides for me, I provide for her. So she doesn't have to worry about what she's going to eat, or what she's going to put on, or where she's going to live. You know, she has a secure place to live. She has food to eat every day. She has clothes to wear. She has everything that she has need of. She doesn't need to worry about those things because she serves me and I provide for her. I serve God. God provides for me. She serves me. I provide for her. So her job is to serve me. And that's a wonderful job, ladies. That's a wonderful job. When your only job in the world is to serve your husband and make him happy, knowing that he will provide everything that you have need of, and you don't have to worry about those things, that's wonderful. Just as it is for us who are Christians to serve the Lord. We serve him. We don't worry about the things of this life. We serve him, and he gives us the things that we have need of. He said that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It wasn't a joke. He was serious. He meant it. And I know because I live it, and I hope you're one of those who lives it too. Praise the Lord. And if you haven't been living it, then live it. Trust in God. Trust in God and the words that he spoke to us by our Lord Jesus Christ and the prophets. Trust in God. Believe his word. Lean on the everlasting arms. I love that song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Lean on him. Trust in him. 
Trust that his word is true and lean on it, stand on it, and you will see that he is faithful. As he said, as it's written in Deuteronomy, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments unto a thousand generations. Praise the Lord. And so, if you're a Christian husband, then your wife should be in subjection to you. She should know that you love her and that you cherish her and that you respect her. And she should also know that your word is the law in your house and that every decision that pertains to her life is yours and that you are going to give care to making those decisions for her so that all those decisions will be made with her best interest at heart. And if you're a wife, then you should know that your husband is your Lord. Lord with a small L, yes, but he is your Lord. He is your master. That means whatever he says goes. It's not for you to make those decisions about life. It's for you to let him make those decisions and for you to serve him and please him. That's why you're there. If you're a wife, that's why you're there, to please him, to take care of yourself, to keep yourself looking nice and, and smelling nice and all that good stuff, and to be pleasant and to have a pleasant attitude, and to keep the house clean and orderly, and to do the things that he likes, to do the things that please him, so that when he comes home from work, after having worked all day to, to provide, he comes home to a nice, clean, fresh-smelling house and a nice, clean, fresh-smelling wife who has a smile on her face and says, I love you, sir. What can I do for you, sir? That's what a man needs in his wife. You see, and when you do that, you will see that the Lord will bless you. He will bless your marriage. He will bless your life. He will bless everything that you set your hands to because you're doing all these things because you love Jesus Christ, our Lord, and you desire to serve him. Praise the Lord. So if you've been raised up all your life in the Western churches and, and you've been taught all contrary to this and all this message, and you're still with me after an hour and two minutes, praise the Lord, and all the, everything that I've said in this message is like totally from Mars to you, well, praise the Lord. Welcome to the church of Jesus Christ. Welcome to those who are begotten of the word of God and who belong to the kingdom of God. And... May God bless you as you receive his word and put it into practice. Because it is only those who believe his word and put it into practice that shall enter into the kingdom of God. And yes, that means that the vast majority of people that call themselves Christians are headed straight for hell. They are. That's the reality. The vast majority. And I'm talking about more than 99%. And that's not hyperbole. That's reality. More than 99% of people that profess to be Christians, Catholics and Protestants alike, they're hellbound. They're hellbound. Why are they hellbound? For the same reason that the people of Israel, when they left Egypt, they, when, they, when they were on their way to the Promised Land, God swore from heaven in His wrath that those people would never enter into His rest. And out of 603,550 men that left Egypt to go to the Promised Land, not including their wives and children and the, and the strangers from Egypt that were with them, just the men, those, those that were over 20 years of age, 603,550. The Bible gives us the exact number of the men of Israel that left Egypt to go to the Promised Land, out of all those men, 603,550, how many entered into the Promised Land 40 years later? Two. Joshua and Caleb. Two. And the ones that entered in with Joshua and Caleb were the children of those 603,550 men. But those 603,550 men that left Egypt to go to the Promised Land only two of them made it in. The rest of them died in the wilderness, and they're in hell. They've been in hell all this time, and they'll be in hell forever. Now, what percentage is two men out of 603,550? I don't know. I haven't figured it out exactly. But I'll tell you this. It's way more, pardon me, it's way less than 1%. Way less than 1%. Because 603,550, what would be 1% of that? 
6,035. I'm just off the top of my head, I think that's right, 6,035. I think that would be 1%. If 1%, if 1% of the people that left Egypt to go to the Promised Land, if 1% of them entered in, it would have been 6,035 men. But there were actually only two. See, so that's less than 1% of 1%. That's a real minority. And that's why the Lord said, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. You know, I mentioned Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 earlier in this video. So let's read that and then let's close this message, if God wills. Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now the straight gate doesn't have a G-H in it. it. It's straight. It means narrow. Narrow. Enter ye in at the straight gate. A straight is like, an, it's a name for a narrow body of water. Like a really narrow port or portal. Straight. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth unto what, boys and girls? destruction destruction for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat the catholics the protestants the islamists the the orthodox jews the seventh day adventists the the jehovah's witnesses the mormons all these are on that broad path that leadeth unto destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate. Straight. Straight is the gate. And narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Again, Jesus our Lord was not kidding. Few there be that find it. Who are the ones that find it? Who are those few? The ones that read the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and obey the Word of God. And of all those people in the various churches, whether they call themselves Catholics or Protestants or whatever, they all exclude themselves because they are all pertaining to organizations of men that are called by names that are made up by men at the advice of devils. They've separated themselves from God because they call themselves Catholics or Lutherans or Pentecostals or Apostolics or Baptists or Seventh-day Adventists or whatever. I could go on and on. All those people that belong to those organizations that are called by those names have separated themselves from God. They have to be called by other names than Jesus Christ because they're not the Church of Jesus Christ. And they're not the Church of Jesus Christ because they're not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. They're abiding in the doctrine of a religious denomination, which is called by a different name than Jesus Christ. You see? So they're not his bride. And they all say, my pastor preaches straight out of the Bible. But they don't know that their pastor is preaching straight out of the Bible and at the same time lying to them because they've never read the Bible. If they had read the Bible and believed it and obeyed it, then they wouldn't be sitting in front of those false pastors believing their lies. They would be serving Jesus Christ. See, because the Bible says that the disciples of the Lord are called Christians. Praise the Lord. If this message has been a blessing to you because you're a Christian brother or sister, praise God. I thank you for being here with me this hour and eight minutes, nine minutes so far. If this message has blessed you because you've never heard these things before and God led you here and you listen to this whole message and you're just like, Praise the Lord, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. Uh, I was raised all my life in a false religious cult, and it wasn't until I was 30 years old that I began to read the Bible for myself. 29, actually. 29 years old. I began to read the Bible for myself. And as I did, as I was reading through the Bible, I, I marveled. Because I was raised in church, and I was never taught the things that are written in the Bible. My pastor preached straight out of the Bible in the Lutheran cult which I was raised in. And, and later on in life, I started going to Assemblies of God churches. 
you know, when I was a young man. And they still never taught me the things. When I, when I read the Bible for myself, I just marveled because it was on just about every page that I had to speak to my Father in Heaven and say, Father, why didn't they ever teach me these things in church? Well, of course, the reason they didn't teach me these things in church is because they don't know them. Because they're not Christians. You see, that's why they're called by all those different names. So again, Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you continue in his word, then you're his disciple. He said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Praise the Lord. I hope that this message has been and will continue to be a blessing to many. And may God bless those of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen.